hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, yes, you welcome to the next MAV Brown Bag with myself, Greg Robertson. Um, on tonight's MAV Brown Bag, uh, myself and Renee will be going through what is required in a VCDX submission. Um, I noticed there's a couple of VCDXs actually as part of the attendees, so that's great. Also, um, if people want to put in their comments, that's perfectly fine also. Um, always more than welcome. So yeah, we'll be going through what is required in the VCDX submission. Um, Renee, if you just want to go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so as normal, um, if you want to get on, in on the conversation, then you can use the at the brown bag Twitter handle um, or even the Twitter hashtag, hash, <laughs> Twitter hashtag, hashtag the brown bag. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on the question area and also Twitter to yeah, bring in any questions. If you have any questions, then you can um, ask them away. I'll try and get them answered as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, if you want to um, be, if you want me to unmute you, I've muted everybody because I don't want to hear your dog barking in the background, etc. Then yeah, raise your hand or even write in the question area if you want to ask something or clarify something. Then I'll unmute you and yeah, you can chat away from there. Um, yep, yeah, I would say tonight's guest is Renee. So. <laughs> um, he blogs from BCDX 133 and I blog from the Safa Geek. Um, so, yeah, um, Renee, I don't know if you want to cover yourself quickly. Um, oh, uh, yeah. You are. So, yeah, well, you already kind of covered me. Yeah, BCDX 133, I'm the chief architect at Saudi Telecom Company in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I blog at bcdx133.com. Cool. Um, so yeah, we wanted to put out a disclaimer um, that none of us are VCDX panelists. Um, we don't know or nor have we seen the scoring rubric the VCDX is scored with. Um, none of us work for VMware. Um, what we're putting in here is based on our own experiences and also both of us having gone through the VCDX process. Um, Renee was successful. I was not. Um, so this is not official recommendations from VMware. What we're saying is literally from us. Um, I noticed Chris Colotti is on the call, so possibly he'll put us in line if we say something that isn't true, which is perfectly fine. Um, and yeah. Um, <laughs> Also, yeah, we fully believe the VCDX is achievable with dedication and hard work. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yep. So go for it. Okay. So um, first thing is here are some of the resources that you can refer to. So obviously we have the official VCDX blueprint. This URL here is for the data center blueprint. Um, next month we have the art of infrastructure design. V Brown Bag podcasts, which are March 3 and March 10, tentatively at the moment, where VCDX number one will be joining the podcast. Um, he's also working on a book that is titled with, uh, with um, that name, which is also coming out sometime this year, Q1 or Q2. That's uh, tentative at the moment. Uh, the vCloud Architecture Toolkit from VMware is also an excellent resource, so that's point number three. Uh, there's also a vCloud implementation example that you can use to refer to, so I think that was authored by uh, Duncan Epi. You have the VCDX, VCDX Bootcamp book, which was published in 2013, that you can also use for your VCDX prep preparation. Uh, Derek Seaman put out a, um, an architecture outline that you can also refer to here. And I also have my VCDX preparation series that has a lot of information in there as well. So the design methodology for VCDX. So it's based upon the Zachman framework. Uh, you have the conceptual model. So this diagram is just a straight cut and paste out of the blueprint. 
your customer requirements have to translate to the logical design and then the logical design has to translate to the physical design. So with uh, everyone on the call, I'm sure you're aware of this framework. Um, so we will move on. The other thing that you need to map to is the design qualities. So the way I remember the design qualities is AMPRS, so Availability, Manageability, Performance, Recoverability and Security. Now this is from the Data Center Blueprint, so you can see the major areas of the blueprint that you need to address is the data center management, virtual machine, compute, network and storage. If you're going down the other uh, VCDX tracks, then these areas change depending on the blueprint that you're addressing. So the conceptual model, um, one of the things that doesn't get talked about a lot is when you are having discussions with um, the business of whatever client that you're working for, they are not going to talk to you in technical terms, right? So here are some technical examples. They're going to talk to you in business language. So things like best customer experience, reduce your operational costs, fastest time to market. These are the types of language that they're going to talk to you about when you are designing a solution for them. So you need to be able to take those requirements, record them, and then translate those to technical requirements, which these are the, um, uh, the requirements, constraints and assumptions that you're going to design to in the conceptual model. Okay, so here's some examples here. So uh, require, requirement one is all business critical applications will have an SLA of four nines. Uh, there will be no single point of failure. Then you have some constraints. Constraints are things that you, uh, limitations that you need to adhere to within your design. And assumptions, assumptions are things that you don't really know about, but you're assuming that this is going to happen, right? And you need to address that in, in, within your design. For, for, for the requirements, um, sorry, just it, you've come in into it, and as Renee's saying, you've got, you got to take a lot of the business things and um, people that possibly aren't consultants or are consultants but maybe don't do a lot of design work. One of the bigger challenges that you kind of need to go into, and that's what, how it applies into the VCDX, is you need to take, if you're trying to do a real world example, even if you're doing it for your own company, but it's not a real design per se, but you imagine you're doing it for your current company, you better take that kind of piece in. So there's going to be people who aren't technical, who don't understand what high availability can do and what, what, what the different technologies are and how you map to them. So you, you need to take all of that, speak to all the business people, the, all the subject matter experts, take all of their different pieces, work in different workshops with all of them, and then try and work out from all of their different pieces, what are they looking for from a business, from a business perspective, and then, as Renee said, apply it into technicals to say, someone saying, okay, well, great, um, I have an SLA of this many hours, this, and then you work out that map to three nines of availability. Or if it goes to, say, five nines of availability, then you need to say to them, okay, well, this is going to obviously impact and bring in a constraint possibly because you are going to need certain technologies to obviously meet those kinds of SLAs. And that's, that's where any good designers, especially going into VCDX, is what you need to do. And um, it, it really comes into, as Renee was showing with that AMPRS, you, you need to try and keep a whole holistic view and make sure each point is also meeting. Is it meeting availability? Is it a positive or negative or not impacting at all? And you need to also apply it to a lot of that pieces. Yeah, and just back to your example, if the customer says to you that they need five nines of availability, that translates to five minutes of unplanned downtime per year. If you have a cost constraint within your design, then uh, that, that would become a requirements conflict, right? Because if you're trying to do five nines of, avail of availability, that's going to increase the cost of your solution. Okay, so... From the, um, the conceptual model, that you then go into the logical design. Now, this here is just a, a template that I use. Um, 
So obviously logical design decisions are where you are talking about the technology from a functional perspective. So you're not talking about vendor specific hardware or technologies. Yeah. So just as an example, uh, this here is the, you can see here I have the design reference. Okay, so we'll get on into that towards the end. But basically what you want to do is you want to number everything. Okay, so that you can refer to different components of your design to work out, uh, it's, it's like you're building a net to see, to guarantee or to check that your conceptual model is being mapped to your logical design and logical design is being mapped to the physical design. And by having the cross references, you can build a matrix to see where there are gaps within your design. So I've got an example of that later. So this here is a, uh, a storage logical design decision. So here I've called it number one. So it's selecting the storage protocols for your solution. Okay, so here it's fiber channel, FCOE, iSCSI, NFS or direct attached storage. Here the theoretical design choice is, okay, I'm going with fiber channel. What are the design qualities that I'm meeting with this logical design choice? Uh, availability and performance I've put in here. What is the requirements reference? Okay, so this is mapping back to the conceptual model. So I'm saying requirement one, requirement two, and constraint one is being met with this design decision. Right now, if I just quickly scroll back up to where we were before, you can see here requirement one is the SLA statement. Requirement two, no single point of failure. Constraint one is that a particular array, storage array is being used that we, we must use. So this is how you're starting to build the framework of your design. Then the next part is, uh, is, there a, is there a requirements conflict? I'm saying there's none, but if you did have a requirements conflict, this is where you would talk about it. You would say, okay, I have a conflict with this uh, constraint or requirement, and this is how I resolved it, okay? So this way you have a very clean design where everything is laid out, easy to read. Uh, from there you have the justification. Why did you make this decision? Here I'm saying that we have an existing monolithic fiber channel storage array that must be used. So that's constraint number one. So that's the reason why I'm doing this. Then you have the impact. So what is the impact of making that design decision? So obviously for no single point of failure, if I'm using fiber channel, that I'm going to need two sand fabrics at least. At each of my hosts is going to need at least two HBAs. Then from there, I have the risks. Okay, so obviously fibre channel with vSphere has uh, a design limitation, okay, which is the number of one IDs and the maximum size of a data store. Okay, and that's one logical design decision that's been made. Okay, so from there, uh, you also, within your logical design decisions, uh, or your logical design section, I should say, you also want to use lots of diagrams, okay? So this here is a typical example that Greg's put together of a functional uh, design diagram. So you can see he doesn't actually mention vendors, he just talks very generically about the storage array, okay? So storage processor A, B, it's generic block diagrams, okay? that are easy to consume and understand. So from the uh, logical design choices, you then need to start mapping, mapping them to the physical design. Actually, just before I go on. So Greg, have you got anything to say about the logical design section? Um, yeah, so I think, uh, as I said, we, we've, we've kind of stuck in the, this conceptual logical physical part um, because I've noticed a lot of people commenting about it on Twitter and on the community, the different things. So I thought this was very applicable and it is something that you have to do in your VCDX submission. Um, so it was something I wanted to go over and kind of show. It's great that Renee did this table because this is what funny enough, I'm, I'm also starting to apply into my design and I know a number of people do it um, and it, 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 it does force you to really make sense of what design decisions you're making and the impacts of it because that's the real challenge. I think that's the real test of a VCDX or at least one of the tests of a VCDX 
that the VCDX tests you on, is being able to to make a decision and also holistically look at it and see what what impacts am I making? Is you know am I meeting the customer's requirements? Am I impacting any of the requirements due to this? Is you know with Renee Singh stating it had to be fiber channel storage. That that's that's a that's a constraint that you had to follow. So because of that constraint, you've now had to do something. So that. That's something that then ties in. Um, with the design quality, um, I think everybody does it a little bit differently per se. Um, I, I personally, for me, I did a table where I'd say availability, is it a positive or negative or non impact, and why I thought it was positive or negative, if that was the case. Um, everybody to themselves. Um, but yeah, as I say, I think we wanted to go through a lot of this and yeah, when you're going into logical, um, you don't want to be talking about vendors, you don't want to be talking who's doing what, because that all falls into physical. A lot of people's designs I review, um, and first I'm not stating I'm perfect by any stretch of imagination, but a lot of people's designs that I've reviewed over the past, um, quite a few people have put in vendor pieces in the logical design, I know for the VCDX, they don't mind if you state it. Obviously, in my yeah diagram here that um, Renee showed, I've just said hypervisor. Obviously, you put in VCDA, hypervisor is going to be VMware. You're going to be using HA, etc. So that it it shouldn't be an illogical piece, but obviously, I think that's overlooked because it kind of isn't obvious that you're going to go down that route if you're putting in a VCDX design. Um, but yeah, I think. It's it's all about the mapping between all of this. It really is making sure you meet all of the customers' requirements, and you're not making it too complex. You're not throwing in the kitchen sink per se, and then you're making manageability extremely hard, and you're adding overhead or whatever impacts you're putting in. And so, yeah, I just as I say, I wanted to kind of just do a over overview and recap of what these all are. I think if you've done your VCAP DCD, you should know all of this stuff. But I think a lot of people still find it quite difficult of how do they do it. Um, so that's why I wanted to just stick it in here. Yep. yep. And, and of course, um, you can use whatever template you want. This is the one that, I, that I've developed and used. Um, whatever documentation style floats your boat, that's what you should go with. Um, this here is just a suggested format. Okay, so then we get into the physical design. Physical design is about actually selecting physical infrastructure and, and making design choices about which vendor you're going to go with. All right. So same as before, I'm not going to reiterate the whole thing, but basically the one difference between the logical design table that I had before and the physical design table you're seeing in front of you now is that now we have a logical design reference here as well. Okay, so you can refer to the conceptual model, but generally you're going to be referring to logical design decisions, and that's how you link them together hierarchically. Uh, so we just quickly go on an example. So here you can see we now have physical storage design decision number one. Uh, so here the design options are the type of storage array that we're going to select. Uh, so here I've selected a particular um, vendor's storage array that was specified in the constraint, constraint number one. Here we're designing for availability and performance. And here in the requirements reference you can see I'm referring to my logical storage decision that we talked about earlier. Yeah. So because the conceptual model, the requirements and the constraints were already covered in the logical uh, the logical design decision. I don't have to talk about it again. I just refer to that functional decision, and that's enough. Okay, and that links them all together. So same thing again here. Was there a requirements con uh, conflict? What was the justification? What is the impact? And what are the risks? Okay. So that's basically how you link it all together at the most fundamental level. Level. Now, obviously, depending on the blueprint that you um, 
that you're designing to, okay, so is it data center, is it desktop, is it cloud, or is it network virtualization? There are going to be technology silos that you need to make sure that you cover, okay? So these generally translate to sections within the document, okay, within the architecture design document. Okay, so here you can see uh, vSphere infrastructure management, compute, network storage, backup and recovery, business continuity, disaster recovery, okay, so RPOs, RTOs, WTRs and that type of thing. Uh, virtual machine design, security design, uh, if you're doing desktop, there's end user computing component and if you're doing cloud, there's a cloud management platform component, etc, etc. So what's also very important to do is make sure that you cover the risk analysis, okay? So the way I've put it together, this is how I do it, I have a risk section at the end of each design decision. Now, what's important is that you create a risk analysis table of some sort, okay, so normally that would be a section in your architecture design word document, and in there you need to take each of those risks and list them, quantify that risk, is it minor, major or critical? What is going to be the remediation uh, mechanism or methodology to mitigate that risk, okay, so generally risks are mitigated by standard operating procedures, um, some sort of test, some sort of design decision that you are going to use to mitigate those risks, right? Now, why do we have risks? We have risks because every design decision that you make has a pro and a con. The trick is to make sure that you make design decisions that correlate with your business requirements, okay? So whatever risks that you have, you want to balance them so that they are not going to impact the most critical business requirements that you have, right? Every design has risks, okay? So you need to make sure that whatever the risks are that, it, that you have in your design, you recognize them, and then you have some way to mitigate that risk. Uh, of course, you need a bill of materials. So every architecture design should have a bill of materials at the end of it. What do I need to order to make this solution a reality. An abbreviation section is also very important, so whatever two-letter, three-letter, four-letter acronyms that you have, put them in the, in the abbreviation section. References, very important. Uh, whatever white papers, design methodologies, documents that you've used, make sure that you refer to them. If they're not publicly available, you need to provide them as a soft copy within your design submission. Okay, so if it's publicly available on the internet, um, just provide the URL, test it, make sure it works. If it's behind a firewall of some sort, then you'll have to um, uh, provide it as a soft copy as part of the submission. Also very important, sometimes people overlook this is to put together the broadsheets of the design. So generally speaking, we're talking about a logical design broadsheet and a physical design broadsheet. So these are the blueprints of the design that go hand in hand with your architecture design. And also a naming standard is also very important. Uh, Greg, you got anything else you want to add? Hello, Greg, can you hear me? Uh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, yeah, so for, oh. for the references, um, I think what comes across for a lot of people though, they'll, they'll do the, they'll put in the reference and they'll say, I'm you know, referencing some internal thing. Now that's perfectly fine. Um, I've, I have a few of those and that's, you know, my, my design's based on a real customer piece. So certain things are based on customer documentation, how they've mapped things out, for example, um, SQL builds. So um, all of my virtual infrastructure databases were on a SQL build that was specified and built specifically to my customers' um, standards and specifications. Now, I did a reference to that, and I've actually had to go and write up a sanitized version of that document because yeah, I wouldn't want to put the customer's one out there. But I think that's the thing. People forget references. They'll put in whatever they're doing, but they'll forget where that reference is. And as I said, I'm not a VCDX panelist or a reviewer, but 
I'm fairly certain that obviously if they're going to be looking through your BCDX submission and you reference something where you've made a major decision, maybe my, my SQL one's not a great example, but if, you, if you're referencing something as a major decision, you have to put in where you got that reference from, why you're doing it, and what the reasons are, just to show you understand it. And if you, if you don't, if you can't put in a reference, and you need to put it in your design. Because it has to be one or the other, or else I would imagine you're not going to get through the BCDX reviews. Because they're going to look at it, they're going to make a, a decision, whatever it is, and then if they can't back it up, they're going to go, well, I don't feel that what you've said, you know, you've, you haven't referenced it, you haven't given a good reason for it. Maybe they'll take you to review, and that you'd be challenged on that. Maybe you wouldn't even get through the review. Obviously, try and stick that in there if you can. Um, yeah. And yeah, and, and risk, and risk analysis and, is massive, also. Yeah, and that's actually a great point. Um, uh, like the other words, you should never have in your design is best practice. Like you're the expert, you need to make sure that you are the one who is justifying whatever design decision you make. Uh, and I suppose the statement is, you're an expert. Experts have the ability. To, to go against best practices. Best practices are for people who are not design experts. So you should never use that statement in a panel defense or in a design document. Yeah, because I think the, the, the true challenge and the true part of being an architect, um, any kind of architect and anybody who's, and especially that's what I think the VCDX is really testing you on, is you have to take all your knowledge, all the that, and then apply it to what the customer wants. So possibly, you know, a best practice that meets everything, it normally works for everybody. Maybe your customer has something that's very different. Maybe they want, uh, let me say, you know, say they want 50% of their resources reserved for HA. Now that's normally not something you would want because that's a waste of resources. And in your portion, you could say to them, an impact is, you're leaving 50% of your resources for failover. If the customer is willing to do that, they're willing to pay to essentially have 50% waiting around for a failure because they want no downtime, then that's that. But also then you need to look at it and think, okay, is there another way of me doing this where they don't have to reserve 50% so that they could save on money, but they're still getting that availability, resiliency, etc. they're looking for. And that's, I think that's a true challenge of the VCDX and being an architect is to try and take it. And even if somebody says, I want 50%, maybe you need to challenge it. Maybe you need to say to them, actually, that's great. I understand what you're saying, but here's a better solution and it's going to save you money. Because most customers will thank you for doing that. Though, you know, obviously some people are fairly high-headed, but if you can show them a good reason why and you can specify it, that's, that's what every customer would want and that's what they would want you in the VCDX to do. And you know, even if you go to the panels, yep, that's what they're looking, sure. they're saying, what happens if but, the customer says they want to do NFS? You know? Particularly if cost is a constraint, you know, you, you want to have a realistic headroom uh, for for HA, and also let's let's say that you've got uh, three nines of availability, right? And they're asking you to do database clustering and applica application clustering and all that kind of stuff. Well, you can use vSphere HA with DRS and provide three nines of availability quite easily, you know, if you have a good design. Um, of course, in vSphere 5.5, you've got App HA as well, which further increases the availability that uh, HA can deliver. So this is the stuff where you need to be an expert and you need to make sure that you design solutions that are simple enough to meet the requirements of the customer. If you go ahead and chuck the kitchen sink in, as Greg mentioned earlier, you know, mm -hmm. and you're making the design more complex than it needs to be and more um, expensive than it needs to be, then you're, you're uh, not doing your job as an architect. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know one of the test pieces that comes down and they say it's, you've got to meet a certain amount. And normally, in a real world design per se, you do availability, manageability, performance, recoverability, and security. But normally, there's also cost at the end of that. Now, the VCDX doesn't really test you on that. So you don't have to state 
this is due to the cost. But if you're going and buying, you know, 500 storage arrays, then that, that's that's going to show that. You can't throw in every single technology if there's not a good reason for it. I know a couple of people who went in. Well, now it's defunct, but they put in um, decent heartbeat. And that, that's perfectly fine, but obviously that's a really expensive product. So you have to have a really good reason for doing that. Or else, you know, you might get to the defense, and then you have to explain why you did heartbeat. And if you can't explain it correctly, you might not make past the defenses. So you have to really look at it. So, yeah. <laughs> Yep. All right, so uh, this is another screenshot from the blueprint. So this is the supporting documentation that you need to provide. So implementation plan, installation guide, operational procedures, and a test validation plan. Now this here is just an example of um, the template that I use for the impl implementation plan. So you can either use a table within a Word document or you can use a Gantt chart and maybe export that as a PDF. Um, I suppose the main thing is that whatever PDFs that you submit as part of your submission, the panelists need to be able to read it quite easily. Yeah, so uh, as part of your review process, you need to check for readability um, and their uh, their ability to understand what you what you've written quite easily. So this here is just a very simple table: task number, task description configuration item reference, how long is it going to take and what is the resource that's going to use it. Uh, the installation guide, so this is where you'll see all through here there's a unique numbering system. So in the implementation plan I have the task number that is being referred to and I have the configuration item that comes from the configuration guide or the implementation guide. Um, uh, that will also be linked. You could also go even further here if you wanted to and also refer to uh, test items uh, and also standard operating procedures if you're going to do a soft launch. So the installation guide is what does an implementer need to follow to build the solution? Yeah. Now, obviously, the focus is on vSphere here and the VMware suite of products, depending on uh, the blueprint that you're following. Obviously, you want to use existing public documentation where possible. Uh, some people will go ahead and um, do screenshots and all that kind of thing and build their own configuration guides. Uh, me, I think it makes more sense to use public resources and put in the unique um, configuration data that's unique to your design hand in hand with the public resource. Okay, because what you want to do is you want to have the most compact documentation possible. You know, you shouldn't be just putting in loads of screenshots just for the sake of it. You know, because when the panelists review your design, my understanding is that they have a four-hour design. Uh, sorry, a four-hour review window. So if you have lots of uh, documentation that's very long-winded and difficult to read, then they're not going to be able to get through your submission in time. Standard operating procedures. So this here is just another table that um, that I used as an example. So here's a unique standard op uh, standard operating procedure number procedure number, the name, the description, and the frequency. Um, obviously, if you have the time, you should break this out with more detail, actually documenting each of the steps. But for me, when I submitted, I just had a table with this amount of information, and that was enough to be accepted to defend. Test and validation plans. Obviously, you're going to have different test types, right? So here, what I follow is functional acceptance, reliability, and performance. So here, I have a unique test number. What is the test name? What is the test description? And what is the expected result? Okay. So this test numbering, uh, when we get to the end, you'll see that for every physical design decision that I have, I'm going to have an a matching implement implementation task, I'm going to have a matching configuration task, a matching test task, and also matching standard operating procedures. Yeah? So you need to make sure that the design decisions that you've made based upon the conceptual model, 
map to the logical design, to the physical design, that you have supporting documentation that covers that entire design, right? So if you have gaps, it means that you have not delivered a full solution to your customer, okay? What that means is if you have gaps, is you increase the risk of failure. Okay, so that's what this is all about, minimising risk, maximising success. So this here is my solution metrics matrix. Now obviously the blueprint doesn't talk about this at all. This is uh, some of the example um, um, tables that I use to try to make sure that every design decision that I've made is mapped through the supporting documentation uh, to make sure that I've covered all of my requirements. So here on the first slide you can see I have the conceptual model reference with a short description is mapped to the logical design references to the physical design references, right? So within the architecture design, I map everything I listed in this matrix, okay? I also have the second variant is which is for logical designs being referenced by the physical design, okay? And if I have any gaps, then I know that uh, I'm not meeting all of my requirements, okay? So this is like I'm throwing a net out to make sure that I'm capturing all of my customer, customer requirements. Then I have this third table here where this is where the supporting documentation is mapped to the physical design decisions, okay? So for every physical design decision that I make, I need to make sure I have an implementation task, a configuration guide reference, a functional acceptance test, uh, reliability test and a performance test reference, and also a standard operating procedure reference. Then down here, this uh, fourth table is I'm mapping design qualities, right? So in each of the logical design and physical design decisions that I had, uh, I have got different qualities there. So availability, manageability, performance, recoverability, and security. So I will actually put those reference numbers into here and then I will count them. Now obviously if I have a design that is very heavy on security, Okay, so I have a very high number of logical design and physical design decisions, right? And one of my major requirements from my customer was performance, okay? And let's say my performance numbers are down, then that will be an indicator to me that my design is skewed in the wrong way, okay? So if you have a customer that says, look, security is not that big a deal to me, but performance is and recoverability is, if I have a small number of performance and recoverability design decisions and I'm very high on security, then I'm not meeting my customer's requirements. So this here is just a, another tool that you can use uh, to measure the success of your design meeting your customer requirements. Now this final table here, table number five, this here, uh, a set of counts based upon the silo of the design. So here I've got virtual infrastructure management, but also I can have compute network storage. So this here is quite a long list of silos. And here I summarize, I count the number of design decisions that I have, logical and physical. How many requirements conflicts did I have? How many risks? Uh, the implementation plan, how many tasks did I have, configuration guides, all the supporting documentations here. And by having this matrix laid out, I can see for each of the technology silos where I'm strong and where I'm weak, okay? So let's say for compute, I have a very small number of design decisions, yet for networking and all the other technology silos, I actually have a, a, a nice solid number of um, design decisions and supporting documentation references, right? So that would tell me, that would be an indicator that for, for compute, I, I need to beef it up. I need to do some more, some more, more work there to, to have a strong design where I cover every single technology silo. Um, great, before we move on to the final slide, have you got any comments here, mate? Um, yeah, so I know possibly people watching us, people even on the call. Um, 
the, the, the requirements matrix is um, quite, what's the wrong word, I wouldn't say breathtaking, but it, it, it is quite, it does take your breath away, but a description of it. It, it is a lot of stuff, um, funny enough, it's something that I'm currently applying to <coughs> my VCDX design, I'm hoping to submit relatively soon. Um, and it, it, it is a lot of work, I think, if you can do it from the beginning, if you're just starting out, I'd highly recommend doing it then, um, because trying to retrospectively do it isn't as simple as possible. I'm doing it at the moment, but it's not as simple as if you had started from scratch. But it, it does really help you to actually look at what's going on, make sure you're meeting all the requirements, and really make sure you're meeting all of it. I mean, as Renee's gone through the design qualities of availability management, the performance recovery and security. And that was what I was kind of saying earlier. For me, I really stuck that in my design for each portion. He's obviously referencing it rather, which is, I think both are fine either which way. Um, but yeah, if you can get through all of this, this, these requirements matrix, I want to kind of be clear on it. It isn't something you have to have in your design. It's not in the blueprint. It's not something there. But it's one of those things that I think is highly beneficial if you can do it. So, you know, a, a part of me is probably the way I was like in high school also is I, I used to try and look at the shortest route to get to things. And so when I say you don't have to do this, maybe a few people will say, oh, great, no, I'm not going to do that. I'd highly, highly recommend doing it, even though it isn't something you have to hand over because the, the real test and the real piece of the BCDX and really any design, to be honest, um, is making sure you meet all the requirements and you map those requirements throughout the design. And if you can do that and you can do a requirements matrix and show where you're mapping those, it makes it easier for your customers, if it's a real world design, or even the reviewers to look and go, great, I can see straight away he's gone and said that he's going to do percentage based HA, for example, with an N plus two, which works up to this percentage, and you reference you know, um, R103 availability. That's great, because then you, they, they can look at it really easily and go, great, that's why he's decided that. And it meets everybody, it, you're showing, you're meeting the requirements, and that's really where you need to do it. That's really where the whole VCDX comes down to in any design, is really being able to meet the customer's requirements and doing it. Um, also, Paul, I, I did see your question. I just wanted to kind of ask it before we move on. So. I hope I'm understanding this right. You've asked, why would it, why would it not be wrong to disagree with the panelists on cost? It's a huge impact, and the panel doesn't know the real situation. Isn't your job to stand up to the panel too? So, if I'm understanding you right, you're saying, why would it be if the panelists say, I think you you, you posted that when I was talking about you saying to heartbeat. You're saying if it's if you're saying that's really expensive this is the reasons why. You're right, if you did be sent a heartbeat, if, as I say, I hope I understand your question right. If, you, if you're doing something that be sent a heartbeat, for example, and it's a lot of money, but if the customer wants that, and that's a good reason, then yeah, you motivate why you did it. You say, the customer wanted this, the cost is this, the customer was more than willing to do that because this was, this was what they wanted. They were willing to pay it for you know, the customer is a major bank, and so the downtime of a host or a service going down is, you know, say, five million a minute or something crazy like that. That's nothing compared to doing V center heartbeat, and that's perfectly fine. But I agree with you. It is something that you have to stand up to the panel. So you're right. Don't remove things. If it, I think for me, when I took my, my first submission, um, I put in a real world design, and also my second one I put in a real world design, and a lot of the reasons I put in there was, well, the customer chose it, and that was true, but I think I didn't motivate why the customer chose it, and I, some of the feedback came on there, and I think that's where you really need to go in and say, the customer chose this, I challenged them on it, and this was the resulting piece of it, so you really need to show that you knew what they were doing was possibly not best practice, but this is why they chose that, 
and you you motivated that, and you probably have it in your design. You say it's a risk. They've gone and said that they're only going to boot off a single USB, for example. That's a, that's obviously a danger because if the USB goes down, the host goes down. So that's a risk. Now, if you tell the customer that, and they say, I'm willing to put up with that risk, then you need to say, okay, I'm putting in this risk. They've motivated it, and they are willing to do this. But what I've tried to do is I've tried to make my design in a certain way so that if there is a loss of a host, I'm still meeting their availability, etc. So I hope that's answering your question. Um, if it isn't, then yeah, <laughs> just tell me. Um, but as I said, hopefully that's kind of answered your question, at least as I said, from my perspective. Yeah, so the, the thing is you just need to own your design decisions and have alternative scenarios where if this was not a constraint or there was I didn't have this requirement and I would have done it this way to show the depth of knowledge and your expertise, you know? Yeah, it, it, that is a big one. I mean, as I almost alluded to a lot earlier, you, you need to, when I tell some people that they, they maybe stress out a bit, but one of the things you need to know, because you're an architect, you have to understand that maybe your whole life, maybe you work for a vendor who only does fiber channel, for example, then you need to be at the VCDX and as a good architect, you have, to be, you have to know all different ways of doing it. So you might have it where they'll say, okay, well, you've gone down fiber channel. What happens if that constraint disappears? What would you have done and why? And that's what you need to think about. And maybe that's later on down the line, um, possibly once you've submitted and you're maybe starting to prepare for the panel. Um, you, you need to have an understanding of why you've done certain things. And if that constraint wasn't there, so say the customer didn't say they wanted 50%, how would they have done it and why? And that's what you really need to do. You need to also show that you under, you know what the correct way of doing it, and if you had it, how would you have done it? I think that's really important, is you need to have a good understanding of if certain constraints weren't there, how would I have done it to utilize the best of VMware's technologies and all the other supporting technology to actually meet the customer's requirements. So maybe if you did fiber channel but NFS would work better, then you might be asked that, you might not be, but you need to maybe think about that and say, okay, that's fine, this is real, this is what brings my design. But actually if that constraint was removed, how would I have done it? And that's really important. And that's the toughest thing about VCDX, having been minimally qualified in each of the technology domains. That's the toughest thing. Like you could you could be an expert in everything except for maybe business continuity disaster recovery and that lack of knowledge you, you would fail and you would have to come back and do it a second time. For sure. I mean I, I brought it up and um, a few people want to, I know Renee you are not with me. Um, when, we, when we were talking to, um, to Carl and Rob and Chris Colotti and when we were doing our VCDX um, Q&A panel, one of the questions um, somebody asked was if I'm strong in, say, the five areas, I don't know the exact number out of the blueprint, but say there are five areas and you're really good at everything but you're rubbish at networking, but you ace all the rest, um, if you're not meeting one of the core pieces, if you're not meeting networking, for example, then you will fail it because you, you, you have to have understand, you have to understand, okay, the network's been done this way, what is the impact on my design? And it was possibly one of the, actually I know one of the, the things I wasn't great at in my first defense was I knew all the, v, I knew all the VMware pieces, but my T-skilling probably wasn't strong enough. And that's something I think when you're going through all of it, make sure you understand why did the networking guy do this? What was his reason? Maybe he did something that was wrong, and that's where a true architect comes in. You don't have to be an absolute specialist in everything, but you have to have an understanding. So if somebody does, uh, you know, a, a, a networking protocol for <laughs> like HTTP, for example, they're putting that in there. You have to know what's the impact on that. What is that going to do to VMware, and what's that going to cause? And that's where that's where I think the real challenge of in becoming an architect, never mind the VCDX, is you you have to have an understanding of 
all the different components and how it's going to impact what you're delivering. Yeah. All right, so um, other advice. So my advice is start from scratch. Um, don't, you, there's loads of templates out there, particularly if you work for a VMware partner or a VMware themselves. They have their own set of um, templates that you can use. My advice to you is start from scratch and um, uh, that way you own your design from day one. Okay, you won't be tempted to cut and paste and use some of the standard blah blah that's already in those templates. I don't think it's going to help you. It'll hurt you. Uh, also, make sure that your total documentation is set. You can review it within four hours. So this is my understanding of the panel. It's time limited at the moment. Brevity is your friend. You need to assume that uh, the people reviewing your design are technical experts. You don't need to explain NFS or fiber channel to anyone. You just need to present your design decisions. What are the impacts? What's your justification? What are the risks? Okay, you don't need to explain it to anyone. So the same goes for any fluff that you have. Any fluff text, cut it out, bare bones that makes it very easy for people to review and read and understand why you're doing what you're doing. Okay. Uh, I already talked about public content, so just reference the URLs as long as it's not behind a firewall or some sort of login page. URL is enough. You know, If it is something that is unique to your organization, let's say it's on your internal SharePoint server and it is imperative to your design, you'll have to provide PDFs in a separate directory as part of your submission so that the panelists can review that. Uh, when you look at the total, your total submission, so the total page count, you're talking around 200 to 500 pages generally. We're all different. We all do documentation in, in different ways. Uh, obviously, the documents that will have the highest page counts are your architecture design and also your configuration guides. So they tend to be the longest. The rest of the supporting documentation can go up to 20 or 30 pages. It's generally not that long, depending on how much detail you add. And then, of course, you have the time. How long is it going to take you to prepare your submission? So it varies. Uh, some people takes 100 hours, others takes 400. I know for my first defense, I think I was nudging on the 500-hour mark. Um, it's the toughest part of submitting for the VCDX. And generally what you find, if it takes you two or three times to, to um, uh, defend before you win your number, um, the toughest is, is the first time, right? Because the second time that you defend, you'll generally take your original design update it, fix whatever was wrong with it, and then submit a second time. Okay, so that there is generally a shorter amount of time spent on the documentation for the submission, and then you can spend more time on the soft skills and preparing yourself for the actual panel defense. Um, what else is there to say? Greg, you got anything? Yeah, I mean, the, the, as you're saying, the, the, the page counts vary. So I know a few people who have put in possibly designs um, that are maybe on the leaner side and have succeeded, and that's great. And I'm not saying you should or should not succeed. You know, if you can do, if you can meet all the customer's requirements, you can do everything in a short page count. Brilliant. If you're going into, you know, for me personally, I think once you are design, you know, any kind of architecture design that's starting to go over possibly 150, 200 pages, uh, there's probably a lot you maybe have you know, linking to your fluff piece. Maybe you have too much stuff in there. I mean, uh, it varies, as I say. Maybe you, if you have good reasons for it, that's great. But also, as I say, in the review time, someone's got to go through that design. If your design is hundreds upon hundreds of pages, it's going to take them a while. And maybe they'll miss certain things that are really important, the scoring or whatever else. But I'd highly recommend trying to keep it in, try and use tables if possible. Um, yeah, it's just I don't don't go over and tell people. Well, DRS is this, this, this. You know that that maybe for customers, maybe you would put that in there. If somebody's brand new and they don't understand VMware, but you know there's no need for it. You could even really keep it short, put it in a couple of lines, and say DRS is this. 
it's VMware's you know, load balancing mechanism, and that's perfect. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't go on for ages. Um, on the submission time, I've seen some people say, I only spent 40 hours and I passed it. Brilliant. If people can do it within 40 hours, tip my hat to you. You're obviously, you know, really great. If it takes you a thousand hours to do it, I don't think that's a problem either. You know, everybody's at different levels. People maybe want to put in more effort. Um, not saying you, you should or shouldn't put in more effort, but either which way, however long it's going to take you, I think is fine. You know, it, it might take some people longer, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just because you spent longer on a design doesn't mean your design isn't as um, it, it doesn't it isn't as good as the, the person who maybe only spent 40 hours. So uh, yeah, always do that. But I agree with you. The real challenge, I know for sure, and I'm sure anybody that's tried it or even succeeded on it, I think the real challenge is yeah, putting in the hours to actually do your design. It's, it's a challenge when you've got a job and a family or a girlfriend or whatever is applicable to you. Um, that, that is the challenge of it. Um, and that's why I would highly recommend people to start looking straight away and try and keep your head down on it, keep focused on it because before you know it, weeks, months go by and you think, oh, you know, I was really doing well six months ago, but I kind of took a bit of a break, and now I've forgotten half the reasons I did stuff. So if you're going to do it, you know, try and put it in. I know Craig Kilborn and I, um, yeah, shout out to Craig, who's in hospital. He was meant to help us tonight. Um, Craig and I did a London VMAG presentation, and one of the big things we said, and I'm sure most people agree with it, is you have to get support from your family because it does take a lot of time. Um, even if you're doing it on the lean side, you're only putting in 100 hours. 100 hours in your evenings and weekends is a lot of time. So try and do that. Try and get support from there and also support from the company if possible. And the support from the company is always helpful. They can be reviewers for you if you work in a company where people are at a level that they can do reviews for you. Um, sometimes they don't even have to be technical. Somebody reads that and goes, I don't understand what you're saying here. Maybe you do need to simplify some things to make it more applicable. Um, but yeah, I think good luck to anybody doing it. I think it, I think it is achievable. We said that in the beginning, and I really believe it. It is achievable um, for some of us, like myself. It's a journey. So you try. Uh, I do it to force myself to learn new things. My stuff I've learned from it's brilliant. Um, and you know, as I said, some people are able to only put in maybe less hours than what I've done and achieve it. And I, as I say, hats off to you, then you've, you've obviously got a lot more experience, a lot more knowledge, and, and credit to you for that. Um, but also, yeah, don't be ashamed if you feel that it's going to take you six months to do it, because I think that's perfectly fine also. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's not a competition. It's it's a unique journey for every single person. Depends on where you are, what you're up to, how many years of architecture design experience you've got. Do you work for a partner? Do you work for VMware? Are you a customer? All these factors uh, are unique to to everyone. Just one other yeah. thing I wanted to mention was if you do start from scratch, make sure that you don't just start writing globs of information. Um, make sure that you have a structure. So this is where using these tables and the unique numbering, everything that I've talked about earlier, this is critical. Make sure you do this from the start. As soon as you start writing down globs of information, you will have to go back and break it down, okay, to extract the requirements to, and to map them and to, to link them together. So it's very important that you do that. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. They're start from, start from scratch. I mean, even if you do use a template, for example, don't depend on the template. Um, I know a few people that use the template, they put it all in. Um, I can't remember who it was, but I don't want to say the wrong person, but he, he was talking about his. Uh, Why do I think Rob said it last a few weeks ago? And as he said he, he submitted his, and a lot of his stuff, he got feedback on it, and he said they thought it was very boilerplate. So I think. That's something you also need to be careful of. You don't go and put out a, a whole template 
and then you know you, you probably won't get through review and you won't understand the reasons why. So certainly starting from scratch is ideal. If you want to use a template, use a template. But certainly don't depend on it. Um, the, for the VCDX, for the understand people are going to use templates. If you do work for a partner and you do have access to certain templates, it's perfectly fine. But they really do then check and make sure, do you, have you gone and expanded upon that template? Because by using a template, you might be using a bit of a crutch. And they don't want that. So you've certainly got to make sure that you're not utilizing templates and not giving additional information above that. So either which way, make sure that you're giving your information, you're making it your own. Hmm. Yep, all good. <laughs> okay, Greg, we're at the top of the hour. Is there any yeah. other questions? Um, it, uh, so far, no. Um, uh, cool. Enough, I've, I've never seen so many VCDXs on this V brown bag before, which is great. Um, hopefully, I haven't offended anybody again. Um, well, ho hopefully we didn't muck it up, eh? Hopefully our <laughs> advice is solid. Well, as I said from the top of it, you know, we, neither of us are panelists nor is the same rubric. So if we had said something wrong, um, I do apologize. Um, you know, this, this is a community podcast, so in the community, if I've said something wrong, then, you know, we'll clarify, we, then I'll tell me, I'll clarify it in the blog posting when I print up the video for that. that. Um, yeah, so some of the, thanks everybody for joining. Um, as Renee said, um, not next week, but the week after, um, John Arashid and all his co-authors are coming on um, to talk about their new book, which is Art of Infrastructure Design, a Practical Guide for IT Architect. Um, so yeah, join us for that. Um, it, I've been very fortunate. I'm one of the reviewers on the book, and it's been brilliant. I've been using it part of my VCDX preparation. So yeah, please do join in. Um, hopefully everybody enjoyed it tonight. I'll try and get the recording up as soon as possible. Um, I know I said that for the one I did a couple of weeks ago, but because it was a video recording, it went a bit wonky. Um, but yeah, I'll try and get this recording up as soon as possible. And yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Renee, thanks for co-hosting with me. Um, and yeah, ho uh, lastly, um, hopefully our co-presenter who was meant to help us, Craig, is getting better. He's in hospital with appendicitis. So hopefully you get better soon, Craig. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you.